Welcome back, Warrior Fam. Yay. Thank you so much for being with us this and every week. Mm-hmm. We had a fantastic guest today, an old friend of Abby's. Yes. Still a friend, of course, yes. but an old friend. One of friend. my you- longest friends, longest term, oldest, longest. Longest, oldest <laughs> friends. Yes. <laughs> Which is so awesome that um, he had an anxiety story he wanted to share with us. And yeah. it was such a good one. His name is Tom Bradway. And before Abby jumps into a little bit of a recap of our chat for all of us warriors, here's a little bit of, um, about who Tom is after graduating from high school in the Hudson Valley, and then dropping out of college, Tom Bradway joined the United States army. Tom served five years in the army in the military police corps, serving in Germany and deploying twice to Iraq upon returning home. Tom attended SUNY purchase college, where he earned his bachelor's degree in liberal studies with a focus in middle Eastern studies. He then earned his MA in teaching for history from Bard College. He has been teaching in New York City for the last nine years and is now married and has a two-year-old son. All right, Abby, so jump into a little bit of a recap for us. Yeah, so, you know, this conversation, it's just really super special to me. Um, You know, uh, a lot of times you and I share how in the 80s and 90s, like mental health wasn't spoken about a lot. Um, And Tom and I have been friends since um, I was like 16, I think he's was 17. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, like being a teenager is really rough. And then both of us had no idea about the other one and their mental health. Right. And so it's just really special that like over the years in the, in the length of our friendship, we've also been able to open up more and more and speak about our mental health and the challenges, um, that happened. And so it was just really wonderful. I just, Tom's amazing. So I'm just really happy everyone gets to hear his story. So Tommy starts off by sharing how he was in the army and he did two tours in Iraq and how anxiety showed up in these roles where he was um, a sergeant and he was really like in charge of other people's lives and the anxiety of wanting to keep these people safe because one wrong move and, you know, these people might not be returning home to their family. And so he shares how even when he would come back from being on tour, when he'd have these these breaks, he would come home and he would basically drink a bottle of Pepto over two days because the anxiety was so much, it really manifested in like severe stomach pain um, and a lot of body discomfort. Uh, he, He now is a teacher, he's a high school teacher, and he shares how that anxiety has shifted into now wanting to, you know, be a source of support and educate our youth and and how important he finds this role of being a teacher because it can greatly impact people's lives. And so he shares how anxiety shows up in like overthinking and wanting to always do better and always encouraging students and seeing their strengths and making sure that these kids understand that they're worthy and they're valuable human beings. Um, It just really shines through his like dedication and his passion for helping and, and teaching our youth. He shares a little bit about, you know, his, his own enthusiasm around control and how he's been navigating being in a control enthusiast in the classroom, along with being able to be flexible and adaptable when plans don't work out as, as planned or expected. Um, he shares some really just great tips about, you know, his own ways of coping with his anxiety and different things that he uses, um, one of them is just really setting firm boundaries around his home life and his work life. Um, he shares how, how for him, it's really about accepting that anxiety is a part of life and we are all going to experience anxiety. There are things we can still be grateful for, even in spite of the anxiety. Um, and that, you know, for him, it's really about working with the anxiety rather than against the anxiety. Um, this was just, I just, Tom's amazing. And so I'm just thrilled that he was, he was on our show and and sharing his story with us. Yeah. I'm super grateful as well. Um, this was a, I mean, all of our interviews are powerful, but this one was really, really special as you had set off the top. So without further ado, warriors, here he is. Welcome back warriors. We are so stoked to be joined by an awesome guest. His name is Tom Bradway. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yay. I call him Tommy because I've known Tom since 
we were in high school. So he's still Tommy to me. So you'll hear both names from us. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had asked Abby that I was like, cause she just had referred to you as Tommy for so long. And it said Tom and all of our email exchanges. And so I was like, is it Tom or Tommy? And she's like, I think he goes by Tom in the, in the regular world, but he'll always be Tommy to me. I was like, okay, I, I got it. Tom, Tom for me, Tommy for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, let's just dive right in. Um, Talk to us a little bit about how anxiety has shown up in your life. Right. So I think anxiety is like showing up in my life in like a number of ways. So if I am feeling like a little bit of anxiety, like my hands get super sweaty, um, my armpits get super sweaty as well. Fun fact. Uh, so like besides that, like um, like when I'm feeling like a lot of like nerves and anxiety, I would say it like kind of goes straight to my stomach. So I get like a whole bunch of like stomach aches. Um, so I'm also a two-time uh, Iraq war veteran. So when I was in Iraq and like anxiety would show up there, like I didn't really deal with it at that time, but for two weeks, um, you get to go home on leave. So every time I would go home on leave, like the anxiety would show up. Cause like, I didn't know like what was happening over there. Um, so what I did to do that to kind of like calm my stomach nerves is I would carry around a bottle of Pepto-Bismol nonstop. And I would drink like a bottle of Pepto, like, you know, I would say like a bottle, like every other day. I, don't, I remember hanging out with Abby one time, Abby, I don't know if you remember this, but like, you're like, what are you doing? I'm like, just drinking some Pepto. My stomach is <laughs> me. Wow. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I had no idea that was, I mean, in my mind, that's like, oh, that's PTSD. Right. But even, even as we say these labels, right. Like I still didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so share, share a little more. So you, you went, you went to Iraq twice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just have anxiety just thinking about that. Right. Um, and then, um, and then what, what happened? You came back and you were totally fine. No. Oh yeah. Just like that. Like it just snapped the fingers and you're good. Yeah. It's like, hey, welcome back. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that time when like the Pepto really started, that was like the first time that was probably like 2004, 2005 ish time frame, dating myself a little bit. Um, but, and then, you know, so I, I went back to Germany. I was living in Germany at that time. And then I went to Colorado and I deployed back to Iraq again in like 06, 07. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was just like a, a lot of, a lot of like nerves, obviously, you know, a lot of like responsibilities. I am, I believe you guys call it a control enthusiast, I yes, believe is the word, we which, do. We do. Which, <laughs> which I love because I, I am that. Um, and when I don't feel in control, that's when like, you can really see like my anxiety kick in. Like I hate, mm. and, you know, it's also kind of interesting to like, even say it like out loud now, because now it's like, are we ever really in control? You know, so it's just like, yeah, I mean, anxiety shows up and like, I feel as though I don't have control. Um, so as long as I feel like I have a little control, then like my anxiety stays down a little bit. Um, and of course, in that situation, you know, the three and a half years or so that I was in, you know, combat, like there is no control. So um, that was, that was a tough time. But yeah. uh, we, we made it through. You did, you did. Um, and, and I really, I really, I love how, okay. There's a couple of things I love. First of all, I just really appreciate it. We've been friends for so long and we've like lightly talked about anxiety and ADHD and PTSD and stuff. Um, but we never really talked about it. Even stuff like sweaty armpits, like Margo and I are part of the sweaty armpit club too, sweaty right? Sweaty everything club. <laughs> sweaty everything. Um, but, but also like when you're talking about being a control enthusiast, right? Like, like for me, I realized I had a lot of control enthusiasm, um, working in a school for children with autism. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was this element of wanting things to go smoothly and wanting the kids to be safe. But for you in an environment that like has no control, right. And then you are also trying to keep yourself actually safe. Right. Like for me, it was like, I don't want the kids to harm themselves or like hit me. Right. But your level of, of keeping, keeping everything safe was very different. Like, yeah. I don't even know how to say it. Yeah. No, I think it's just like in that, when, when you're in combat, um, I think like, I kind of just like accepted the fact it's like, Hey, if I die here, like, I kind of just like have to accept that fact. Right. But like, 
being like a squad leader and like a team leader, you know, I had men beneath me. So like my main mission or like my main goal was to just like make sure like they made it home to like their wives or like their kids. At that time, I was just a single 27 year old like idiot. Right. So like I didn't not that I didn't care. I wasn't like out there like, Ooh, you know, get me. But, you know, I, if anything happened to anybody, I, I, I wanted it to be me. So that way, I think that's how I kind of dealt with that pressure, that anxiety. Yeah. Um, that responsibility. Um, so that was, I would say like that, that's like the big part. There was just like a lot of responsibility and just to make sure like everybody made it, made it home. That was, that was a big thing. Right. Right. So, okay. So I just have a, 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 a question based on my own curiosity. Like, do you think that you had some type of anxiety before you, you know, signed up to join the army and everything? Um, and, and I'm, I'm assuming you weren't aware of it because I wasn't aware of mine, right? Like, do you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think if we all have anxiety, but you know, back in like the nineties, like <laughs> born in 1981, right? Like the nineties, like they're like, I'm dyslexic as well. They're like, what's that? You know, yeah. like, <laughs> right. I know that I was dyslexic like in fifth grade instead of, you know, 27. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all have anxiety. I think like, everybody has anxiety no matter who you are or what you do like um but yeah it wasn't talked about and because I was a a male growing up in the 90s like he's like Ugh, like no we do, you don't have anxiety like you're, yeah. you're not supposed to talk about it. and if you do like shh, like don't show people your weakness you know right it's like keep it to yourself this or this is a conversation we have at home or you know with a with a counselor at school if you're lucky um, Abby and I talk a lot about what it was like to grow up in, in the eighties and nineties since you're our age and, you know, you all went to high school together. So it's just, so it's a, it's wonderful to, to be able to continue to relate to other folks that experience the same lack of attention to mental health in their youth, in their childhood, in their adolescence, and even through our twenties. Like, I feel like there are notes of this that, that Abby and I discuss all the time with each other. And then with a lot of our guests that grew up around the same time as we did, they all kind of say the same thing. It's like, yeah, in hindsight, I know I experienced a lot of anxiety, but I didn't have a label for it. It wasn't discussed. And then you just brought up being, um, how being a male made that even more different for you. Just like you definitely weren't offered the space to like share about your thoughts and feelings. It's like, no, no, that's not a masculine thing to do. Men don't do that. Boys don't do that. So I just really value you bringing that up. Um, you know, and I, and I just, I mean, I know it sounds like so cliche, but it's like, I want to thank you for choosing to serve the country, our country, um, and for making that choice. And when you said it, it triggered me a little bit when you were like, it's not that I didn't care about my own life, but I cared more about the people that were, you know, under my leadership. And I just, I don't even know. I don't have a question, but I just wanted you to know that like that moment hit me. And it's, it's just like, and you wonder how many other people live their lives thinking that whether they're in combat or not, just like yeah. my life isn't as important as the people around me or my experience, my anxiety, my whatever isn't as valuable, at least in your own head. And I could relate to that in my small way as an educator and a control enthusiast and all the other things. Um, so, yeah, I don't I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to, like, bring that piece back up, because I think that even though a lot of our listeners may not be able to relate to the combat veteran piece, they may have had moments or continue to have moments in their lives where they, they feel like they're not as important as others or that they're everything about what they do is to be, is to be in service of everyone but themselves. Yeah. Um, so I just, I wanted to, I didn't want to continue without saying that Abby, were you going to say something? Well, I think oh. what you're saying ties beautifully into your role now as a teacher, Tom, yeah. like, yeah, we talk a little bit about that and how anxiety is like different now as a teacher, still in leadership, yeah. still, you know, I, I know you, I've seen you and your wife, you put like the education of your students, like ahead of your well being. Right. Like waking up at 530 a.m. back in the day, like, you know, and taking that trip into the city to teach and not coming home until late and grading papers all night. Like and I know it's even different now. So we talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think like um, 
I think like the big thing is, is like you kind of hit it on the head when you said you're putting other people, like it's the most important job I feel like, right? Like, sure. Like going and joining the military and like when people say, oh, like, thank you for serving, like, great, thank you. But like, I was also like, uh, you know, a college dropout living in like my girlfriend's parents' basement when she was at school. So like, yeah, you know, <laughs> did what did like the best thing was for me at that time. But like now, like, you know, being in like the school setting, it's like, there's still a lot of pressure. Um, and I think it is like service. Like I, I feel as though just like the way that I grew up and like some of the decisions that I made when like I was younger, like I feel as though I need to do like I need to do a lot of good in the world, like to, to make up for things that like I've done or decisions that I've made. Um, so I feel like there, that, that's like a lot of pressure. There's like a lot of anxiety, like around like, hey, did I do my best today? You know, like you said, like waking up at 530 sometimes to go to the city or like, you know, staying up grading papers back in the day before I knew like how to really grade papers. So like the pressure of like making sure that like kids do do well, right? You know, and we have kids that like, in all schools around the world that like can't read and write, right? And they're like in ninth grade or can't like use periods, right? So I'm trying to like set them up best for their for their future. And that's like a lot of pressure. And like, if I feel as though I didn't do the best that I could that day, or I had like a, a negative interaction with a kid, like I go home and I think about, um, yeah. I'm super reflective on that. And I don't know where that comes from. Like, I don't know if that's because like my anxiety of like, oh, wow, did I just mess up this kid's life by having this conversation with them? Uh, like that pressure. So like, I, I really do. I think I also put maybe too much like weight on my shoulders sometimes. And that also brings me more anxiety um, and worry and stomach aches and sweatiness. Uh, but yeah, I think like just being in control and having, I mean, I didn't have a teacher say that I I never had anybody tell me I was smart until I was 27 years old and I was in community college and this professor, Ms. Goff McNish said that, and this is after I've been to war twice, 27, and she said, uh, she read my essay out loud, which like in front of the class, she didn't say my name, right? But she read it out, but then at the end, she was like, this person's ideas are genius. It's just like their structure is wrong. So then like mm -hmm. I went up to her after class like she changed my life because it took 27 years old for somebody to make me feel like I was smart. And like, I don't want any kid to like, I mean, even by the time that they hit me, that's ninth grade, right? Like hopefully they already feel somebody's already said that to them. But like, if not, then like, I want to be that person. Yeah. Um, and that way, if like, if I do have that negative reaction or they're like, Oh, I, you know, like Bradway did this or Bradway, you know, gave me a C um, then like, yeah, I reflect on that because like I don't want them, I want school to be like a fun experience and like where they feel better about themselves, not worse, like an escape. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think Margot, I think a similar thing happened, but I got like tears in my eyes Same. when you said that. It's like, I mean, there's so many reasons I had tears in my eyes. One is because like I love you, Tom, right? And like it's so sad that like you didn't have a teacher that acknowledged your strengths and like saw the, the good in you as opposed to like, oh, this kid is, is challenging, right? Or he's not smart, even though he is undiagnosed with dyslexia, right? It's like all those labels and they impact people so much. Um, but then the, the other pieces is just like how important teachers are and how undervalued they are in our country. And like what a difference one teacher can make in someone's life just by saying they're smart or they the possibilities of what can happen in their life or highlighting their different like strengths and stuff. And, and so I just really appreciate you sharing that um, and, and just how important teaching is to you, even during all of this, during the pandemic and, you know, all the attacks on teachers in these last like months and years and all of the lack of appreciation. And yet you yeah. still, your heart is in it. For sure. I feel like what I, the through line I keep hearing through your story so far is just how deeply you seem to care, right? You just seem to care so authentically and deeply for others. And it just, it just shines through. And I thought of this, um, this, I, I've heard it said about parents, but I believe it's the same is true for educators or anyone that's in service. And it's just like, if you are thinking about whether or not you're a good dad or a good mom or a good teacher, right. If that, if that's crossing your mind at all, then you are, <laughs> Even if you're not amazing every day, even if you're not your best, even if you had a, you know, not a great interaction with your, your child or a student or, you know, someone that's working under you or whatever, the fact that you are 
reflecting on it. The fact that you are um, taking the time to be curious and wonder and hopefully show up better the next time and maybe even go apologize to that person. Like that is the best that we can hope for any student, any child. And so if you are embodying that and you're showing kids that, then you're a great freaking teacher. I mean, and just like, I'm sure you were a great squad leader and, and a great father and husband or, and all the things. Um, and so I think too, it's just so, it's just so valuable for all, all of the warrior listeners to remember that if you're trying, maybe not overthinking every little thing, because, and believe me, I know I could speak for both Abby and myself. We have a lot of that, just overthinking every single interaction and, <laughs> oh, how could I have done better with that? But it just means that you really, really care. Like you give a shit about what it is you're doing about how you're showing up. And guess what? Kids need to see their teachers, their parents, their leaders make mistakes, big ones, and then talk about them after the fact in the same way that they need all of us to talk about the fact that we have anxiety and grew up anxious without having any words for it or, um, an outlet or a space to be free with it. So Okay. Um, so fellow control enthusiasts, we're just like the three control enthusiasts here. Um, you know, you talked about this several times today and then in our pre-interview call, um, in the many roles that you've taken on in, in your life, you know, as, as a, somebody who served in the army and now as an educator for many years. So like, how does being in control make you feel? And conversely, like when you're out of it, what do you notice know show up like in your mind, your body, your behaviors, you talked about sweatiness and, you know, stomach pain and all of that. But like in that, you know, in what ways does that desire for control, like help you and serve you in your roles, but then does it also have adverse effects and, and cause you some harm sometimes too? Yeah, for sure. I think like the whole like control part, it's like the preparation going into situations. Um, so that way, like, I, I know there's a plan. And like, I think one of the things that I'm good at is even in, if there's something that happens, right? Everything gets thrown off, right? Everybody goes in with a plan, but then, you know, the plan changes. And I think that like, I'm very adaptable. I, I will make a decision. It's not maybe always going to be the right decision, but it's going to be a decision. Um, so I think in, in that situation, when I kind of can see things coming or there's a plan, I know where it's going. It's for like when I'm teaching, the first thing I do every day is I just put the agenda on the board. I'm like, hey, we're going to spend about this much time doing this, hopefully, and then this much time doing this, doing this. So that way, like that puts kids at ease. And I know that it puts me at ease. Like, hey, well, this is what we're going to do. So that way, when we're done with this part, you know, there's probably about 20 minutes left in the left. And, you know, so like that control and like that plan, I, I, I like that calms me down. Right. That, that makes me be able to kind of be a better person. My voice is nice and low and I can have these great conversations. Now, when something goes off the rail a little bit, as it does on occasion, um, you can hear it in my voice. Like even any like anxiety part, like my voice, like I, I, I'm a fast, I become a very fast talker. Um, and I go up a little bit in like volume, the sweatiness that we already talked about. And I, my kids would be like, just right where your face is getting red. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so like that happens too. like the blood rushes to my head and I feel like just like a little shaky. Um, yeah. And I think that's where it is. And now, you know, being 41 years old, like, I know those symptoms or not symptoms, but like signals. And I was, I was like, okay, all right, let's just take a second, reassess, make a new decision and, and, and let's go. And sometimes it's, Hey, pack up your stuff. We're going to play trivia or pack up your stuff. We're going to do something like it's just, it, it happens. We got to remember too, that they're, you know, 14, 15 year olds. And yeah. I can only kind of remember what it was like to be 15. Yeah. yeah. It was rough. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, first of all, um, I really, I appreciate how you're, how you're sharing that you are a control enthusiast and you have a lot of plans, but once the plan is starting to happen or not happen, right. Once the moment's happening, you're able to be flexible and adapt in that. And I mean, I just think that that is super helpful for kids, period, is to know that like as humans, a lot of us have plans, um, but how do we handle when the plan doesn't work out, right? 
sometimes we just got to play some trivia, right? But it's like, I think that that's such a good, without even explicitly stating it, it's showing how you navigate when things are unplanned, when things show up like that. Um, also you have a, a toddler now. <laughs> I mean, how is that going with control enthusiasm? Cause that one is, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, I think like the most important conversation that I probably ever had in my life is, you know, when me and my wife were talking about trying to get pregnant and it was like, Hey, all right. Like if this happens, just because well, she's a little control freak too. Um, I'm sorry, control enthusiast. Uh, <laughs> nice <laughs> correction. Thank you. Uh, and we kind of just had to say like, Hey, like what happens next happens next. And you have to kind of relinquish control. Um, and so that's helped a lot. Just having that conversation. Luckily my son is super healthy and is on track. He's doing good things and he's, it's great. I mean, there's new words every day. Um, there's also, you know, some bruises here and there when he falls down it's like, ah, my bad. I guess that's on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, just, you know, I think, I think I just want to highlight that you did have your baby in like the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Right. And so navigating all of that too, like all of us control enthusiasts kind of had to throw a lot out of the window when all of a sudden you all are working from home teaching, right? On Zoom. And now you have a new baby. And there's like all these things that can be coming up when you're trying to be a good teacher and a good dad and a good husband and like all these different roles. Um, I just get anxiety thinking about it, right? Like, yeah. yeah. I love to just what I heard was that it sounds like you are good at practicing pausing right before you're able to pivot and adapt to a situation. And that's like a really hard skill to acquire when you didn't grow up learning how to be mindful or how to pay attention to those, you know, signals and triggers in your mind and body. So it sounds like you just have a, a more whole awareness of your own triggers, right? You talked about your voice changing. You talked about how you notice, and then your students notice, Hey, Hey bud, your face is getting red and just like, and how, what a gift it is in a way I'm a little annoying too, I'm sure, but it's like, yeah, thanks kid. I know my face is red. Why do you think that is, you know? Um, but it's just such a great lesson for them too. Like, Oh, what are the physical things that can change in a person when they're not feeling regulated when they're not feeling calm, when mm -hmm. maybe they're in a heightened state, um, of anxiety or whatever. Um, and what a gift it is that you're offering them to be able to say, you know what, what's happening right now isn't working for anyone. And so we all need to pivot to trivia or, or whatever the situation is going to be. Um, and as someone that teaches toddlers like seven times a week, uh, I don't know what it's like to parent a toddler, but I, I can appreciate all the letting go that has to go on with working with and, and being around kids of that age. So raising a son that age is just like, I'm guessing next level. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> um, so let's move into talking a little bit about, um, some of the ways that you like to cope with your anxiety. What are some of like your go-to strategies, things for in the moment, or you talked a lot about being organized and pre-planning for stuff helps to, um, get you in a, maybe in a calm headspace before tackling a task or whatever. So like, tell us a little bit about how you, um, cope with your anxiety. Yeah. I think my wife would laugh when you say like organize in a pre-plan, like I, that's only in teaching. I think that's like the only <laughs> part of it. <laughs> so you'd be like, organize, like, why are you lying to these people? Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the one thing that I, I, I do is I love to cook. Like, I don't know what it is, but I can come home from a day and I can just kind of get behind the stove and be like, hey, what am I going to do today? And like try to challenge myself. Like, so I think just like the process of cooking is, is good for me. Yeah. Uh, I definitely do it. Um, I think another thing that I do is I'm about to start. I, I go to a therapist like every other Friday or every Friday. And I think that has helped me tremendously just to have somebody to talk to. Um, and, you know, I, like I was talking about before in our pre-interview and, my therapist doesn't like give me advice or anything like that, but she, she's just like, I tell the situation, I tell her how I'm feeling. And she's like, yeah, that's, I think that's a normal reaction or like, that's a normal feeling. So like, just to like normalize it and just to know that like, it's not just me who has these feelings um, or like these issues or problems. Uh, that's, 
it's 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 normal um (laughs) i also think like my wife is amazing um so i have conversations with her and she can also tell like hey i feel like maybe you need to go for a walk or like i'm like okay you know so that that one's uh super good what else is there i was like i think there's like one more uh what else oh obviously like i can come home from a hard day and we we work in the same school so if there's something that happens at work like the, our rule is you have the train so we got like a 43 minute train ride like you got the train to talk about it and then like once we're home once we get off the train that day is over and then you know it's just i go home and pick up the kid from daycare do the second second full-time job <laughs> yeah Oh my God. I love that. It's like such a, it's such a good boundary. It's like, we have this time to share about the day, but once this train ride is over, we have to get present to the other part of our life. Yeah. That's, how is that working? How does that, how does that go? Yeah. It's, it's, it's going good now. And I think like this rule came into place. Uh, like I used to be the director of school culture at my job. So I did like all like the discipline and, you know, everything culture around the school. If a teacher was having an issue with a kid, then like I would have to facilitate that. And I think I was driving my wife crazy because everybody was driving me crazy. Um, and I think that's when like we imp- implemented the rule. Um, and now like it's super easy this year uh, to do it. It's been good. Sometimes I'll be like, hey, just one more thing. I know that we said like one more thing. <laughs> this is it. Like this is your one. Make it good. <laughs> <laughs> make it good <laughs> no run-on sentences yeah, no run-on sentences. Just quick, just quick you got to go um so it's good yeah uh, I, I think if you, if you stick to it and then i mean having the kid really helps i mean because mm-hmm. like once you're home like that's that's all you care about you just yeah. want to you don't want to miss anything so yeah. i think that that's super helpful as well Oh, that's awesome. Because I mean, I, I did say this before, but you know, the times I would stay with you in Queens, like I was blown away. Like I would go off and teach yoga and mindfulness in schools, but I could like leave by 8 a.m. right, or 8.30. And um, I was back at your place by like 2.30 or three o'clock. And you all were like gone before I woke up. Right. And then you weren't home until like the evening. And then you would come home you would cook dinner and you both would sit there and do papers. And I, I mean, one, I was blown away by the work ethic, but two, I was like, ah, I want you to have more fun in your lives. <laughs> right. And so I love that your son has, has given you all permission to like, let go of the school day and, mm-hmm. and, and focus on other areas of your life. Yeah. I hundred percent agree. We also had maybe like an adult beverage or two when the papers were saying. <laughs> yes. I, yes. I, I intentionally left that out, you know, but <laughs> yes, but like your little bit of fun while grading paper, you know, like <laughs> you take to, to take those small, you know, wins or joys where, where you can in your free time. But I, also what I heard too, was just like, I love the level of communication. It sounds like you have had and have with your wife about like, let's figure out how we're going to best be able to let it go. Okay. We're going to give ourselves these 45 minutes or whatever on the train to continue to brain dump about stuff that happened throughout the day, especially if you need that, right. So let to, in order to let go. Um, so I just love that you were able to create the boundary, like in community with each other, right. To do what was best for you, you all as a family. I might want to say one more thing. Cause I just really like appreciated that how you said therapy, therapy normalizes things. Right. And I just really appreciate that piece that you said, because it normalizes your experience. Your therapist doesn't even give you advice. Your therapist is just like, yeah, that's normal. Right. And I think with anxiety, a lot of times we think like, oh, I'm behaving, you know, abnormal or, oh, I'm overreacting. Oh, there's something wrong with me. Oh, I, we give all these narratives and, and just being able to talk to someone, you know, especially a therapist who talks to loads of people and can really know what's normal is just so helpful. And I just, I really value that you shared that piece because I just so strongly wish everyone could get therapy. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. A goal, a country goal, everyone, yes. anyone out there listening that could 
make that change. Um, okay. So if you could go back in time and speak to a younger version of yourself, what would you say to him? What kind of advice would you offer? Mm. I would say talk less, listen more. Mm. Uh, I'm a bit of a talker and Sometimes if I just like, I think if I listened or I just waited a little bit, that was another, that's another one of my goals is like wait time and like needing some things that like you don't got to be the first to say something like just kind of people probably feel the same way. Just wait. Uh, so I would definitely say just kind of just kick it back. Think about your words. You don't have to comment on everything. Listen, because then you probably don't have to talk as much and you want people to be heard. So that's something that I'm working on uh, for the last like probably like four years. It's, we're, we're getting there, it's getting better. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I would probably tell a younger me is like, what you're looking for, you're not gonna find in a bar. That would be my mm. other one. Mm. Wow, that's yeah. deep. Yeah, that is deep. <laughs> no, it, it is. Right. I just, I just, I, I feel so joy, so much joy, honor. I don't know the word I want, but just like knowing you your whole life, because you really have just grown and changed and, and just, you were a totally fine human (laughs) in high school (laughs) and you are just an amazing human being. And it's just been amazing to, to watch, to watch you over the years. And be your friend too, but you know. And I think, thank you, first of all, thank you. Uh, and I think like a lot to that deals with too is like, it's why traveling is so important and like going out and seeing like other cultures and the way other people live and, you know, like new perspectives. Um, so, I mean, I think that, I mean, going to the Middle East, uh, going to Europe, mm. South America, right? Like just going and seeing how other people live, their beliefs is just mm-hmm. made, it just makes you a better human being and grateful for what you are and who you are. And like, you just like, oh, hey, I get some other people's experiences now. It's not just like the white, white guy from uh, upstate New York, right? It's, there's a lot out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that you added that piece at, at the end. I mean, just, and just how much there is to that we can gain from listening, right. From being a witness to other people's lived experience to, I mean, it could be the simplest thing. Like I I got the sense that maybe you were talking about, like, if you're in a work meeting and a question is asked of you hang back, let like your team answer first, or let other people say their, say their piece, hold space for them. Um, and so I, I love that as somebody in, who's in a leadership role, you're, there's so many different ways to lead. And a really good leaders know how to sit back and listen to the people that work for them and with them. Um, so I love that. I love that piece of advice, just talking less, listening more, um, and just embracing all the, all the things it sounds like you're really grateful for that you have had, that you've had an opportunity to do and see and experience in your life. Um, and that none of those things were in a bar. That's, I mean, that's just interesting, <laughs> you know, like other country countries and cultures, I guess there are bars in all those places too, but you know, maybe those weren't the places where you gained the most learning or, <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So final question before we dive into some lightning round fun, um, what does being an anxiety warrior mean to you? I think it means just acceptance. Like it's gonna happen. You're gonna have anxiety on a daily basis, sometimes from the moment you wake up. Um, But like, hey, at least you woke up, right? So take it, there's a blessing in there, roll with it, learn from it. Uh, And then maybe you will learn something and then you won't have anxiety about it the next time. Um, So I think like, that's the big thing, just like, just keep, I don't want to use the word fighting anxiety, right? But like, just kind of like rolling with it. Like it is, like it's it's part of us. Um, it's always going to be part of us. You're never not going to have like anxiety. So I think it's just like dealing, working together with your anxiety. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think would be, would be where, uh, that's how I would define being like an anxiety warrior. Yeah. Right. And that, I love that you said like, and, and, you know, at least I'm waking up, right? Like you can still, 
even though anxiety can be rough, anxiety can bring up a lot of stuff. Like I can still find gratitude for parts of my life, even when I'm having (laughs) some stronger forms of anxiety coming up, you know? And yeah, I just love that. It's just good advice. Learn how to roll with it. It's not easy. It's not going to be like a cakewalk or a walk in the park. It's, it might be really challenging, especially when you're in the weeds, but if you can find a way to roll with it in Mm -hmm. the acceptance, it's, I know it's been game changing for me. Yeah. So I guess I'll just speak for myself there. I, I love that, that definition. Yeah. All right, Tom, this has been so much, so enlightening, so inspiring, but it's time to play. It's time to play. Are you ready for lightning round? <laughs> Uber dorks. <laughs> I've had anxiety about this, just so you know. <laughs> yes, a lot okay. of people do. <laughs> a lot of people do, yeah. Trust me, it makes us, every once in a while, Abby and I will throw a question at each other and I'm like, wait a minute, I wasn't ready for that. We mm-hmm. weren't supposed to do that together today. <laughs> um, all right, so we're just going to go back and forth and ask you a fun, just hopefully not anxiety producing question, mm-hmm. like a get to know Tom kind of a question. Yes. All right, Abby, I'm going to yeah. throw it to you first. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to start with a two-parter, but I think it's an easy, I think it's a lob. Okay. Um, the first part is what got you interested in teaching history? All right. That, that one's easy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, got me interested in uh, teaching history is going to war in uh, Iraq and then like sitting there and being like, why are they so mad? And then like going back and like getting, like learning about Middle Eastern history uh, and being like, oh, that's why they're mad. Uh, So (laughs) I get it now. Uh, So I think like just kind of like world events, right? Like current events and like, like history was always my favorite thing in, in school, because as I mentioned before, like being dyslexic, like I could look at maps, there was pictures, Mm. you know, there was paintings. So I could, I could look at those, right? That was my lens in. um, So like, I was always just kind of in history because nobody else could kind of like afford that opportunity to me in any other subjects. So right. that's why it's free. Wow. Wow. Okay. And so then the second part is, um, if, if you could go back to a moment in history, right. And like either be in a moment or meet a famous historical person, either one, who would it be? Or where would you go to like be there for a day? I don't know. You know? I'm going to Woodstock. <laughs> like 69, <laughs> like the concert. <laughs> wow. I was so not expecting that. Answer. <laughs> Without a doubt. Going there. Okay. I love it. I love it. That's a great answer. Back to the roots. In a way. <laughs> anyway. That's good. Okay. All right. So my turn. Um, so you said you love to cook. Now let's imagine that you have your own cooking television show. What is your signature dish? And you have a choice to either share the name of your show or the name of your signature dish. Mm. That's a good one. Uh, There's so many dishes. Uh, (laughs) So I think like, I'm like a grill master. I, I'm a self-proclaimed grill master. I also have like a smoker, so I, I love to smoke uh, meats and stuff. Um, but I would have to do like a name play. So I, I maybe it would just be all about like brunch because like brunch, you can do breakfast and lunch and dinner kind of like all together. So I, maybe like the name of the show would be like Brunch with Bradway or Bradway's Ooh, Brunch. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, Alliteration yeah. all day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be it. Uh, I'm also like a, a Italian cuisine. Like, oh God, I love it. It's the best. I can make a good okay. carbonara. Um, yeah. So yeah. And I'm getting so hungry. <laughs> I've had a few of his meals. They're good. They're really good. The last lunch we had uh two years ago, a year and a half ago. Mm. That was good lunch. You grilled. There it is, I yeah. feel like well, this needs to happen. We need Bradway's brunch. Like this needs to become <laughs> yes! a place. Yes. <laughs> Bottomless mimosas. Yes. <laughs> He's starting to take those away from us. I need more of that in my life. Okay. All right. Um, so I know that you like the Broadway show Hamilton. Mm. Okay. What is one of your favorite songs from the show 
And can you give us a line of the song? Wow, man. So I am not up to date as much as I was on my Hamilton back in the day. It's been a while since I've listened to it. Uh, I think the, I, I can't remember the name of the song, but like, uh, I'll be, when like the king's like, I'll be back. Yes. Right? Oh my God. I'll be back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You will see. Right. That was like, that one, that one was. <laughs> You at the time that's the one that i left to me yeah, that was the one that like i left singing yeah um yeah so that would that would probably be my favorite one at the time um but i mean they're they're, they're all good <laughs> depending on like what mood you what mood you're in, like if you're like a little self like pity it's like uptown like where's it like, oh, <laughs> oh it's fine like, in uptown <laughs> yeah. but like it's the skylar sisters i mean yeah. that was such an a, anthem yeah, there are so many. Uh, <gasps> and yeah, I can, I need to listen back up again. That's what I'm, maybe I'll hit that up on the train ride home. Yeah. Little, like, All yes, right. I love that. Yeah. Skyler Sisters is such an anthem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Let's keep on the song thing because I feel like you like got out of having to sing something just now. <laughs> so um, what is like your favorite? Do you have like a guilty pleasure artist or band or song and then like we need like a line from it mm. so i'm a huge like 90s rap guy like i, I love it um I'm like that's not my guilty pleasure because i listen to that right um, you're not like kind of ashamed to admit that it doesn't sound so like what i've been listening to a lot is um lake street dives like i love ah. her um so you know like the Polaroid or what's it called? Like the camera taking bad self portraits or, you know, tell them I'm a good kisser, something like that. That's, <laughs> those are, those are like the two. That's all you're getting from me. As far okay. As- <laughs> Fair enough. Fair. I, I, I feel, I feel vindicated that Abby asked you to sing and you didn't. And so we needed a little, that little, we need a little, you yeah. know? Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, didn't didn't Lake Street Drive? Didn't they do the like the remake of the Jackson Five song? Uh, I don't know. I just know that, like if you ever watched like Somebody Feed Phil on Netflix, okay, that they did the introduction to his song. Okay, okay. okay. Um. All right. My final question, and I'm down between two. Choose wisely. I know. <laughs> I know. Um. All right. I like asking this. So what is something a little bit dorky about you? Hmm. It could be like you do dad jokes or, you know. Oh, man. Something. Some people think like golf is dorky. I play a lot of golf. Like that's like another <laughs> I do. It's yeah. a very dad thing to do too. Right? <laughs> so it sort of encompasses both things. Right. So I mean, oh man, dorky. I mean, are you wearing the little the little pom pom hat with like the knee no, 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 Oh my like god, that. that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would actually make it cooler. Right. I feel like the only thing good about golf is the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my opinion. I'm sure it's not a popular one amongst golfers, but. Well, I guess you're... dorky, yeah. like Halloween, like I dress up for Halloween on like the school day. Like we dress up, like I have, like one year we all got a whole bunch of uh, onesies of different animals. So like, we just walked around in onesies and then I like, realized how comfortable and warm they are. And then wore like a onesie around my house for like November, December, January. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the That's animal layover? Yeah. Which animal? Right, but, uh, it was a flying squirrel. So I had like nice you know, the wings. Yeah, yes. The wings. Great. Yes. Great. Solid. Right. So, all right. So you wore it for like months after. Right. Yeah. Love it. Sure. Love it. I have wife, like an, yeah. my wife had like a parrot one. And then I, like, <laughs> It had like a little like tail on the end. So I don't remember like shake your tail feather by like Nelly. Yes. Matt to her like all the time that she was in it. That's that oh story. <laughs> I'm having a vision of you just like walking out of your house to throw something into the garbage pail dressed as a flying squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like sure. take out that garbage bag. Okay, you got it, honey. And just like <laughs> this flying squirrel just kind of traipsing over to the garbage pail. Your mm-hmm. neighbor's just like, hey man. <laughs> Good people are weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. 
Final question. So in our call, in our pre-interview call, you told me how much you deeply hate traffic. Mm -hmm. And Abby and I are both in that same exact camp, hating Mm -hmm. traffic. I think you even said that like, if you're in bad traffic, you have to pull off and let your wife finish the drive, which I could relate to. Um, So like, give us your best. Now this is audio media. So like your best, like verbal impression of yourself and like what you, how you would be reacting to suddenly being (laughs) traffic, like give us like a sound or like, you know, your go-to word or like whatever. Mm. So, yeah, I think like the traffic, I kind of become like a little aggressive and like, that's when I know I'm like, okay, you gotta you got to like get out of there because I feel slighted if somebody, you know, goes onto the medium to like go around you or like, yes. if or if, yeah, if there's like an accident, like, and the lane goes down to one, like one in and then go one. Yes. In, so, like, don't do that. Like it makes right. me like, super mad. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 um, I would probably just like my, the sound that would be, would be like, eh, <laughs> you're a fucking asshole. Yes. The- <laughs> <laughs> so you lay on the horn you actually hit the horn i'll be, I'll be like hard to get their attention drop <laughs> like the middle finger and then that is like when i look over and then i'm just getting like the look from my wife like are you kidding me right now and i'm like okay next exit <laughs> and then switch happens yes 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 that is a lot of injustice right it's yeah. like common sense people like just- i'm getting heated thinking about these assholes on the road like <laughs> Just be yes. good. Just be nice. Let, yes. like, just be a good human. Yes. Right. Learn how to merge. Yes. <laughs> We've all been there. Let We're the all in merge. the same boat. Just right. fucking do it. <laughs> like, yeah. so cool. You're going to be there 30 seconds earlier. Great job. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best, most vindicating feeling too when they wind up at the red light that you're at. Yeah. And then you're just like, oh, look at you. So far <laughs> ahead of me. Right next to me, brat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> deserved. Deserved. Okay. We're, I like how we're all in like slight, like rage mode. Yes. Talking about I'm ready traffic. to fight people now who are talking about traffic. <laughs> Three New Yorkers, this is what you get. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. This was so much fun, Tom. Thank you so much for playing with us, for sharing your um, anxiety journey with us and all the warrior listeners. This has just been like so awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, before we go, do you have a win of the week? for us we like to ask our guests to just share anything big or small that felt like a win yeah so my birthday is may 27th and my son's birthday is also may 27th so we had like a joint birthday party with like 20 people and the weather was good thank god we were outside um so like six toddlers um i like couple like almost like preteens i guess like it's 10 preteens sure um, yeah <laughs> uh, like cooked fed them cleaned up that night it was a success we had fun um and now i'm just eating a shitload of like macaroni salad and sausage and peppers for lunch because i have lunch so that that was that was the big win we threw like a a a good a good size party and it went well and my house isn't completely trashed so yes huge win right there yeah wins on top of wins that's awesome All right, Tom. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on our show. It's been so awesome. Thanks for having me. Yay. Thanks. Bye. Oh my gosh, Warriors. What an interview. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm left feeling just, I don't know. I don't even know. I I feel grounded. I feel like so much of my own story feels valid and seen. I mean, this is, these are the the themes that continuously come up for me when we talk to, um, all the people that I'm, I feel so lucky to be able to talk to on our show, just like how, how much our own stories and, and, um, our experiences are so different from other people's, but there are always that those, bits of sameness. There's always that. Yes, me too. There's always that through line of like, well, I certainly wasn't a combat veteran, but I have, you know, the educational background. I'm not a parent, but I know what it's like to be around toddlers all the time, you know, like, and so being able to always, um, hear from our, our guests and find pieces of myself in it feels just, I mean, it just feels awesome to, it's just, 
it's just exciting to me. Right. It's just like a constant reminder that there's so much more we have in common, even on paper or, you know, when we share our stories, it might sound like they're so different, but there's right. always those pieces of that common humanity or that what we share. Yeah. I mean, I think my first takeaway is just how, once again, we talk to someone now, this was someone you've known for a long time. So someone that's our age who grew up in the time frame that we grew up in and had so many undiagnosed slash undiscussed things, yeah. right. Whether it be anxiety or, um, dyslexia for him. And mm -hmm. the fact that he was never told by any teachers or anyone that he was smart until he was in his almost his late twenties, you know, right. and just how that's impacted who he is as an adult, right. How, who he is as a father, as an educator, as someone who was, um, in, in the role of leadership in the army, just like, how can he, this is what I got from it. It's like, how can I, right. He was talking about himself, but for me, when my takeaway is, is like, how can I better show up in my roles as a leader? Right. How am I showing up? What's, what's the best way for me to show up? Um, and can I also be kind and compassionate to myself when I am not at my best? And I just kept hearing notes of that throughout like how deeply Tom loves service mm -hmm. and that he wants to keep showing up for others, yeah. but at the same time, trying to learn how to overthink a little bit less or look at all of the acts of service for what it is and, and just trying to be better next time, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that I kind of like a takeaway connected to that. Right. Because the thing is like he had undiagnosed dyslexia. Right. And he said that at one point he was a college dropout, which led him to go to the army. Mm -hmm. um, but the, th my understanding is the message that he got a lot was he was stupid. Right. Or he wasn't applying himself or he wasn't. And, and those messages were wrong. <laughs> he yeah. needed to know like, oh, he has dyslexia, he needs a different way of learning, right? Rather than the way that they force children to always learn. Um, and so for me, it's just the takeaway of in one sense, like, you know, sometimes you just need that one teacher. He had that one teacher that told him like, you know, you're smart, like this, this work, what you've written is genius. You just need to learn, work, the, learn the structure right. of the writing. Right. But also the impact of all of those teachers throughout the years that just like let him slip, slide by. Right. And just ignored him or passed him off to another teacher. And, and that too has an impact, right? Like yeah. maybe they were saying unkind things. Maybe they weren't right. But they didn't pause and see oh, this child is brilliant, but he needs different support than what he's getting right now. And so that's right. like a huge takeaway for me is just, again, it's like how much we impact others for better or for worse. Yeah. Right? Like sometimes you just need that one person to help you into the good path. Right. But yeah. also like all of the, all of the teachers that or adults have ignored you along the way, where does that lead you to? Yeah. And how he's trying to be the change now for kids. Like he's yeah. trying to give that to kids that whatever he didn't get when right. he needed right. it as a child, as a student. And how that's why the overthinking comes in. I think it's like, oh, I didn't have such a great interaction with that student. How could I have made it better? What can I do tomorrow when I see them, you know, to make it right. better. And, and if no one else is going to tell this kid that they're smart lately or ever for, for that matter, I'm going to be the one to do it. Right. And like right. having different learning styles or undiagnosed, you know, um, I won't, I don't, maybe issues is the wrong word with a particular way of learning. It doesn't make you not smart. It doesn't right. mean that you aren't a genius as you kind of just, again, reminded me of that moment where it's like, this is actually so brilliant, but here's why the structure doesn't work or whatever. And it's just like, how God, what, and he said, I think a couple of times, how amazing how it changed his whole life after yeah. that changed right. everything for him. And so like, it's such a heavy thing to hold the pressure that of trying to be the best we can be for everyone all the time. And so like, let's just acknowledge that we're all going to make mistakes and in interactions, not, not just with children, but our inner in interactions with everyone all the time, mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. but all we can do then is be reflective, pause more often and see if we can do better yeah. next time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one of my takeaways from this chat was 
just hearing about how Tom has created a sense of being able to pause for himself and pivot. So like we can all relate to the control um, enthusiasm or the three of us could. Mm -hmm. Um, And that came up several times in this conversation and in our pre-interview. And just, I loved hearing about how he's able to look at the control in a positive way and how it's impacted him in a really great and healthy way with setting boundaries um, with, you know, having a plan and feeling organized and how the structure around that helps not just for his own nervous system, but that of his students and everyone right. feels, can feel safe and regulated. But at the same time, being able to like throw the plan out the window and pivot at a moment's notice. And it's like such a skill that mm-hmm. I feel like more skills that weren't taught that, man, that's so powerful that he's able to offer that now to his students, to the people that he works with. Right. You know, his colleagues, his family, his child going forward. Right. Right. And right. We could have all had that growing up like that modeling. And I'm sure in some senses we all had it growing up. Right. Like I can't remember every single teacher I had and if they're flexible or not. But I do remember that in in like school when plans weren't going the way the teachers wanted, a lot of times they just yelled at us. Right. And (laughs) so him embodying like, okay, here's the schedule on the whiteboard. Right. But then like when the class isn't really like going the way he planned and he's being flexible and it's like, all right, you know what? We need trivia. That modeling right there shows flexibility in action rather than like lecturing kids on how to be flexible. Yeah. Right? And it shows the kids that he cares about their needs. Yeah. But he actively noticed that they're, they, whatever he was working on or whatever they were trying to do wasn't happening. And so right. instead of continuing to force it, yeah. Instead making the pivot. Yeah. It's just such a valuable lesson. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of my, um, takeaways from this conversation, you know, is really about, um, when he briefly talked about therapy, right? Because, you know, you and I talk about like how much we, we want to normalize talking about mental health. Right. Um, and, and I think you and I are doing a good job. We're normalizing it. Right. But, but, but I think that so often, people forget that it's okay to talk about mental health. And so like, if someone was saying like, Hey, I'm struggling or, Hey, I overreacted or, Hey, I'm having a hard time. I think in like normal day-to-day life, other people would respond with wanting to fix it or help them. And the way how he said his therapist doesn't even give him advice. She just Mm -hmm. reflects that it's normal, right? Like, I feel like that is so just powerful and important and helpful. That's helpful. Not telling me how I should live my life or offering suggestions for change, but just saying like your experience is valid and your reaction is very human, right? Like even saying it now, there's like this inner sense of peace as I'm like saying it. And I just, I just, again, I just wish everyone had a therapist so that they could just feel more normal even in their challenges and their struggles, right? Like not everything is a problem to be fixed. Sometimes it's just to be witnessed. Yeah. And from a person that doesn't have any skin in the game. Right. 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 Like from someone on the outside of the issue, like on the complete outside of the issue or whatever it is you're dealing with, they are an impartial witness, as you just said. And yeah, yeah, that kind of, um, that, that leads into my final takeaway. So thank you for that, which was just at the end when he was just like, what would he tell his younger self? Talk less and listen more. It's mm-hmm. like what he's getting from his therapist is also the advice that he would give himself and the advice that he in turn offers to, you know, the people he supports in his work life and his home life in general. How can I support? I can be there to listen. Yeah. I cannot be the first one and the last one to speak. I can create space for them. Um, and ha- allow them to be, to feel seen and heard. Yeah. Cause that's the root, right? That's what everyone wants at the yeah. end of the day, or at least that's in my head. That's what I want. That's what I feel like a lot of human beings, if they don't want it, they don't know they want it yet. <laughs> they need it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that, I mean, that connects to my final takeaway, which I mean, Tom's a talker, right? Like he's, I know he wasn't like a huge talker on the podcast, but Tom's a talker. And the fact that he's like, you know, pause and and talk less and listen more is huge. And my final takeaway isn't really from our conversation today, but just from knowing Tom is like, 
he, to me, he symbolizes like hope and possibility because I have had people along the way that I've known that for whatever reason, they blame their past, they can't change. They just are who they are. And even though they're unhappy or they're suffering or they're mean to other people, whatever it is. And Tommy has changed. He has put in so much work to be the amazing human he is today. And he was always an awesome person. Like I'm not knocking him, right? Um, And when I think about like when people say they can't change, like I always think about Tommy and I think about my dad because those are two people that, you know, they, they didn't owe anyone any, like they, 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 they weren't handed the best hands in life and they still made changes in their lives to make a powerful, positive impact on others and just be good human beings. And so you know, my takeaway, like just, just being able to witness Tommy through the years is like change is possible. You have to want it. You have to want to change, but you can do it and it can be worth it. And, and that's really what my, my final takeaway is when, when I think about Tom. That's beautiful. I love that change is possible. Change is possible. Just, just that standing alone. Right. Not even, yes, you have to want, you have to work for it, but just the, just the first seed of it's possible. It isn't impossible. You can do it. It, There are, you know, there are things you can do to make it happen. So yeah, this was just such a powerful and wonderful conversation. I'm super glad I got to meet Tom and, um, connect with someone that's been so important to you for so many years. Um, and we hope that all of you warriors gained as much from this conversation that we did. Uh, I, yeah, it just was so good. So, so good. So thank you, Tom, for being with us and thank you warriors for listening as always. We love you so, so dearly. Um, if you'd like to connect with us, you can find us over on Instagram. We're at anxiety warriors podcast, or you can shoot us an email at anxiety warriors podcast at gmail.com. Shout out your wins of the week, share with us topic ideas, things that you'd love to hear us chat about on our show. Or if you think you'd be an awesome fit as a guest, reach out. Let's um, hear your story. Let's get it on the calendar. We'd love to be your chosen platform for where you share your anxiety journey with the world. Uh, Hop on over to our show notes to check out our merch store. We have some kick-ass merch up there. Control enthusiast, Mm -hmm. brand new, new graphic, new graphic ready for you. Brand new design. Perfect. After this conversation, Mm -hmm. get yourself your control enthusiast shirt, mug, bag, beach towel. We're heading into beach season. Mm -hmm. It's just, and it's such a fun, like seventies, eighties style font. We're like obsessed with it. Yeah. So go grab some, um, some swag for yourself. And of course, all of our tried and true anxiety warrior designs are up there, but brand new design in the shop today. Control enthusiasts, go grab it. Um, And if you haven't yet, please take two seconds and smash that five-star rating. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We're on Amazon Music or wherever you tune in. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Anxiety Warriors Podcast over there um, so we can keep making more episodes, hanging out with y'all. Yeah, help us grow our our warrior community. Yes, yes, Yes. we, we can do it together, all of us. We need your help. Yeah. All right, warriors. We love you so much. Yes. Thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. We're so grateful y'all are here. Till next time. <laughs>